Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome. Um, today we'll be hosting this webinar um, with Gerald, Robin, and Fiona. Um, today, the presenters will discuss the ways that people change for the better after experiencing an episode of psychosis and what may facilitate such change. Um, so next slide, please. So before we start and I pass it off to Gerald, um, I just would like to go over some housekeeping information. Um, so the participant microphones will be muted today. Um, if we get to the Q&A session and you would like to voice out your question, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature in the chat and I can unmute you. If you do have any questions during the event about the topic or any technical difficulties, let us know in the chat. Um, and then just a reminder, this session is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on our website. I will put our website in the chat uh, momentarily. And then just to let people know we are offering uh, continuing educational credits, uh, but you do have to attend the second session happening on the 17th. And more information about that will be going out in a follow-up email tomorrow. And again, if you have any questions, you can always email us. Next slide, please. Um, this is a disclaimer from our New England MHTTC. Um, you can read more about it when we share these slides with you tomorrow. And then um, the MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. And these are some of the examples that we follow by. And with that, I will pass it off to Gerald. Thank you. Hey, uh, okay. So thanks, uh, thanks everyone from, for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. So my name is Gerald. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at McGill University and uh, the Yale Program for community, Recovering Community Health. Um, and my research broadly focuses on um, understanding how people could transform their lives and communities after experiencing um, a, a mental health challenge for the first time and uh, how these changes could be supported by community-based uh, mental health services and broader social determinants of health and resilience. Um, Fiona, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi everyone, my name is Fiona. I am a researcher at the University of Nottingham. I'm based in the Institute on Mental Health. And my research has predominantly been in mental health recovery. And now I'm starting to move into post-traumatic growth and looking at that from the perspectives of people who experience psychosis and personality disorder and also in developing um, digital interventions to support um, post-traumatic growth. Robin? Hello, uh, so my name's Robin. I just completed my master's at the University of Edinburgh um, in the Global Mental Health Program and also was looking at how people can experience transformation and positive change after psychosis and how we can support people through that process. Um, my background is also in filmmaking and peer support and I've worked in the mental health field for about six years now. And I'm also very interested in how we can incorporate storytelling to and um, with mental health advocacy. Uh, I'll just add that uh, that we're, we're probably the uh, one of the only, you know, a group of the only people doing work in this area. Um, 
So you're, you're listening to like the, the world experts right now. <laughs> so, um, okay. So now that I've, I've made the, that, uh, that joke, um, it's, it's not a joke, but now that I've said that, uh, we'll, we'll move on to like our, our conversation. So I wanted, we thought we could, this could be more like a conversation that could be kind of light. It's like in the middle of the afternoon, like everyone's probably kind of tired of being on Zoom all the time. So I thought this could be like kind of a lighter, a lighter conversation among, among us. And then, you know, um, I'd, we'd love to hear um, some questions from you or some feedback. And, you know, that way we could like, you know, co-construct some, you know, some meaning and some, some more knowledge about the, the, the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so to begin, um, you know, just wanted to state that the field of mental health uh, faces many important shortcomings. Uh, one of those important shortcomings is that mental health challenges have largely been reduced to byproducts of biological processes that are enabled to, on their own, uh, supply um, or inform, uh, supply meaning or inform uh, research researchers and practitioners in the ways that people can make meaning out of and recover from uh, mental health challenges. And that this, this reductionism kind of dismisses a wealth of subjective accounts and experiences, experiences around how mental health challenges uh, could be meaningful and rooted within um, larger social, political, and economic conditions, such as racism and other forms of discrimination. Um, so in light of this, um, what are some alternative interpretations of psychosis? Um, why is it useful to think about these different interpretations? When thinking about post-traumatic growth and positive change, um, and I'll, you know, Robin, what do you think about this? Yeah. So as Gerald has mentioned, um, often psychosis is framed as this biochemical process gone awry, but many researchers agree that psychosis is relational and its impact by a person's culture, by their um, wide, wider um, social network and social factors. And, and the context of that person's life. So there's, there's a few different approaches that um, look at psychosis outside of the biomedical model and understand psychosis as a kind of understandable response to adverse um, life experiences and, and a person's surrounding rather than just being a pathological defect. And, and acknowledge that there are meaningful narratives within madness. So for example, the hearing voice, voices mu movement vo views voice hearing and other uh, what we call anomalous or, or non-ordinary experiences as meaningful and existing within the spectrum of normal human experience that people can learn to, to cope with and grow from. Um, another, another one is the open dialogue approach. And again, that's looking at psychosis often from the perspective of, of people responding to, to difficult life events in kind of an, an extreme way. Um, and and they're, they're a person in Florida psychosis is, is thought of as, as having valuable perspectives and that their way of communicating is actually um, giving kind of clues and insights into their, the nature of their distress and, and ways that maybe they can um, find their way out of it. And so there's also theorists such as um, Artie Lang, who viewed psychosis as, as not just a crisis that can have transformative value, um, but, but a purposeful process potentially that can shake up aspects of the self and allow a person to rebuild their lives um, their beliefs and identities in a healthier way and, and process trauma. And then of course, uh, we can't forget the various ways that people with lived experience understand and interpret their, their experiences in psychosis. So a lot of people that, that I've interviewed, for example, saw psychosis as a kind of um, spiritual crisis. And oftentimes people with lived experience are, are dismissed as not having any sort of insight into their condition. And this is something that we're trying to challenge. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds super cool and uh, sounds really, really yeah, relevant to, to this discussion. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Robin. Um, I, I agree entirely with what you said. And I, I think I, the only thing that I would add is that based on the work that I've done, the type of explanatory models or frameworks that people use to describe their experiences kind of changes how they talk about uh, how they've grown from their psychosis. So people who, who use like spiritual explanatory frameworks tend to talk about their growth that they're experiencing 
in terms of spiritual lenses or using spiritual words and you know and then people who who have let's say like political um interpretations or political explanatory frameworks about uh, about what happened to them that might draw on like how they've been oppressed or um drawing on the, the ills of capitalism will describe their 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 changes post psychosis in terms of um you know engaging in activism uh, to a greater extent than before and, and so forth so that's that's something that i've uh, noticed in my work and i, I find uh, quite interesting um and so i guess the next point that uh we'll talk about is, so before getting into what, like the nitty gritty of what positive change and post-traumatic growth are, um, right from the outset, we thought it might be important to, to talk about like what some of the precautions that we should take uh, when, when we're talking about post-traumatic growth and positive change following psychosis. Um, so I'm not sure if um, any of you have seen a, a highly influential paper on the, the misuses and abuses of the, the concept of recovery. Um, I, I think Mike Slade is, is the, the author on it. Um, and so in this paper, they kind of go through like, you know, how the, the concept of recovery has been abused and like co-opted by neoliberalism and so forth. Um, and it's a very influential and important paper. And, you know, when we're doing research on post-traumatic growth or when we're talking about it, like it's important for us to also think about some, some things that we need to be aware of. Um, so in lieu of this, um, Robin, do you have any precautions or any recommendations that, you know, for how we should think about this or talk about it or do uh, research in this area? Yeah, I mean, just to start, uh, it's always, I think, important to say that, of course, there are a lot of people who um, experience great distress with psychosis. And so it, in no way um, do I want to romanticize that that experience at all. Um, and so we do acknowledge that, you know, not everyone does experience um, positive change and growth, or they might not want to experience any kind of, of change, right? Um, and so we really want to, I think, avoid putting more pressure on people to um, fix their suffering and find the silver lining in it. Um, and kind of fuel these unrealistic expectations that individuals are solely responsible for um, fixing their distress um, and putting that additional kind of, kind of burden on people. Um, so, so really, I think what's important is, is putting that responsibility on institutions and, and services to develop interventions that are recovery oriented and trauma informed and, and growth focused and um, that, that are really looking as well at the broader social determinants of distress that Gerald has talked about um, and are supporting diverse interpretations of this thing that we call psychosis, whether, so, so some people like to call it um, altered states, um, some people like to call it anomalous experiences. And so, yeah, just acknowledging that there's a lot of different ways to, to talk about this. Um, and and another, another big thing too, is I think that when clinicians um, understand that post-traumatic growth is possible, then they can communicate in a way that's much more hopeful to the people that they're working with. Very, very elegantly put. Um, Fiona, what are some precautions that you've thought about or um, through, in the work that you've been doing? Yeah, um, I completely agree with everything that Robin said. I think it's really incorrect to assume that everyone will grow from experiences of psychosis. It's, it's, you know, it's PTG or um, post-traumatic growth or positive changes. It's, I guess it's like another model. It's a bit like the recovery model. There will be some people who are strong opponents to it, so they don't like it at all. So there are groups, for example, like Recovery in the Bin, who, are, who have been very vocal about um, putting the recovery model in the bin. Um, but I think from a research perspective, one of the big things that I would say that needs to be done when doing research um, about PTG is co-production um, and co-production across the research um, cycle. So not just right at the end when we're analyzing data, how do we, you know, thinking about how do we involve people formulating a research question or data collection or and in the analysis and in the interpretation of the findings. Yeah, those that's that's a great point. Um, the the only I, I think you you've both hit the, the nail on the, the 
at the hammer on the nail or whatever the expression is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm thinking of like, you know, I, I recently read a paper about uh, the, you know, some aspects of uh, positive psychology in the workplace that are kind of uh, tyrannical. Um, so, you know, like, um, you know, the, there's a, in a lot of workplaces, they're implementing these, these positive psychology interventions focused on improving people's well-being, uh, you know, uh, making them feel happy and that kind of stuff. But they're also at the same time, you know, um, making people work longer hours, um, you know, uh, cutting back on unions, you know, all the stuff that probably everybody in this Zoom call is, is going through. So these interventions are kind of like um, trying, to, trying to help people just kind of like push, push aside the bad stuff that's going on in work settings and then just think about like the good stuff. And I, I kind of worry about uh, the concept of post-traumatic growth or work in post-traumatic growth being co-opted by the same like neoliberal, uh, neoliberal-esque policies that the broader positive psychology movement um, is, is kind of uh, pushing for right now. So, I mean, that, that, isn't, that isn't something that I've seen so far in, in research on post-traumatic growth following psychosis or other mental health challenges, but it's something that I think um, we, need to, we need to be mindful of. Um, and then like a final, final thing that I thought of is, you know, there's this concept of inspiration porn uh, that you look that you read about a lot in the, the disability studies literature so what I mean by that is you know you know you see someone with a disability and they're doing something that uh, people without disabilities think is impressive um, and so we just tend to look at that kind of thing we look at the success and we marvel at how resilient they might be but then we, we tend to ignore the social and political and ec economic conditions of health um, that people with disabilities um, you, you know need to draw on to support uh, their, their, their place in, in, in society. Um, so those are the only two things that I would add about precautions to, to post-traumatic growth and positive change. Um, so now that we've stated uh, these precautions, um, let's move on to what growth actually is uh, in, a, in a meteor way. Um, and I apologize for using meaty as, as the metaphor if anybody here is a vegetarian, um, but Fiona, how would you define uh, positive transformational change and growth? Yeah, um, so from the literature, we know that positive transform transformational change and growth, or also known as post-traumatic growth or PTG. It's a concept that was coined by Tedeschi and Cajon in 2004, and it often refers to the positive psychological changes that can arise following from negative experiences, trauma or adversity. And I think this is particularly pertinent to psychosis because trauma is both a cause and an effect psychosis so um, people can experience trauma and then experience psychosis or psychosis and then experience trauma as well um, so during the time when a person experiences a negative experience with trauma often a person is adjusting or adapting to the new trauma information that they've gained from that experience um, and often people reassess or change their assumptions or the beliefs that they've held before the trauma. So for example, people may reassess the relationships that they may have with people and they may decide that, I don't know, for example, a certain relationship might no longer be serving them in the way that they need, for example, and they may decide to make change to that. Um, often people like will differ in terms of the positive changes that they experience, but generally um, there's five domains that positive changes um, manifest as. So for example, it can manifest as having an increased appreciation for life. Um, people might have more relationships. Um, some people may also be um, better able to identify their own personal strengths. Um, some people may, um, as a result of the trauma, have um, priorities for their life. And also some people may have a richer existential and spiritual life as well. I think one of the important things to note about PTG is that it's often discussed in conjunction with the concept of resilience or the ability to bounce back. However, I think that PTG extends beyond bouncing back. Um, so for example, to previous levels of functioning, but it's about growing beyond that as well. Super, super cool. And uh, yeah, super, that's a super great uh, summary of the, the PTG model. 
um, Fiona. Um, Robin, do you have anything to add about um, what uh, positive transformational change and growth means? Yeah, I think you really summarized it well there, Fiona. Um, and I, I particularly liked how you um, talked about it. It's not just about bouncing back or, or returning to this idea of um, a, a self before um, experiencing psychosis. A lot of people do feel that their sense of self and their relationships to themselves and others and and um, the natural world has really um, gone beyond that and, and improved in a, a deep and meaningful way. Um, so I'll pass it on to you, Gerald, because I know you're the <laughs> you're the the pro on PTG. Uh, cool. I mean, I think you both summarized it pretty well, and I'm not sure if I have much more to add. Um, you know. Um, maybe the only thing that I would add is through my own research that uh, some one thing that I noticed is that once uh, some time has, has passed, people that often report uh, experiencing positive change or post-traumatic growth, um, you know, um, may uh, at some point want to start finding ways to use their personal stories and their personal experience uh, of, of, of psychosis or whatever. Uh, to find ways to give back to their to, to other people and to change their communities, um, and that's something that I've, I've that I've looked at, um, you know, in my own research, and um, and you know, it. Another thing that I found is that it's not only people themselves that report PTG or positive change, but also people within their like their their immediate social environments also report post traumatic growth through the experience of their loved ones. So you know, romantic partners, family members describe uh, experiencing their own forms of growth um, and suffering uh, after their loved one has experienced a, a psychosis. Um, okay, um, now, so many, many of you uh, might be listening to everything that we've said, and um, you might be asking yourself, so what's the difference between post-traumatic growth and positive change and, and recovery? And this is one of the, the, you know, when I wrote my dissertation on post-traumatic growth following a first episode of psychosis, this was the number one question that uh, I received uh, by my dissertation committee. So it just seems, it seemed to be something, um, you know, that that's kind of, um, you know, confusing or, yeah, de deserves some, uh, some dis untangling. Um, and we're, you know, I'm asking this because also many recovery narratives and recovery models emphasize how people transform or feel like they've grown or changed for the better after experiencing a mental health problem. Um, and so that, you know, also uh, ends up sounding a little bit like uh, the PPG stuff um, that, that we're, we're talking about. So I'll just go over a couple of key differences between recovery and PPG. Um, so in, in terms of history, like recovery, the concept of recovery has a very different history from that of uh, PPG. So the concept of recovery was, you know, based in uh, the psychiatric survival movement, um, you know, people seeking liberation from psychiatry and wanting to define their own lives. Um, at the same time, you kind of saw some longitudinal, like long-term studies on how people with uh, the diagnosis of schiz schizophrenia seem to do better over time, contrary to what expectations were at, at, at that time. And then, you know, people started writing their own narratives and stories uh, about their, their recovery. And these would appear in, you know, academic journals, uh, uh, zines, you know, just, just everywhere. And then in the 2000s, you kind of saw like uh, an attempt to transform mental health systems so that they be could become uh, more recovery oriented. And you see, this, you, you see this as an ongoing process that started in the 2000s and continues to this day. And you see this a lot in like, you know, Western countries. Um, and in contrast, the concept of PPG uh, is rooted in a different history. So it's rooted in like uh, existential psychology, uh, religion, spirituality, uh, the work of Carl Rogers. And then with psychosis, uh, you know, uh, Robin kind of alluded this, to this before. It could kind of be traced back to the work of uh, Lang, uh, Carl Jung, who was really interested in the concept of how we, we become individualized as, as people. Um, and then John Weir Perry, who worked with uh, Carl Jung, um, talked about how, you know, when you go through a psychosis, uh, it kind of initiates a, a process of, uh, of self-renewal and individuation. So, you know, going through a psychosis could help you kind of like become more of a, more of who you are. 
Um, another key difference between recovery and post-traumatic growth is that recovery is embedded within a social model of disability, at least it should be. So, you know, to recover, there's an expectation that, you know, there's an impairment, but then you also have to support people, uh, you know, with housing, with giving them jobs, with, uh, you know, eliminating ableism, these types of things will help uh, people recover. Um, but with PTG, on the other hand, and as Fiona kind of alluded to earlier, it's mostly embedded within like a, a psychological process uh, where, you know, you're evaluating your thoughts and you're going through different types of rumination, uh, both uh, um, non-deliberate and deliberate and PTG kind of like uh, flows from that. Um, and then finally, uh, my own work uh, looking at differences in between PTG and, and recovery shows that post-traumatic growth is kind of correlated with, uh, you know, with some in the in the, the field would call personal recovery so personal recovery meaning um you know whatever is assessed on the recovery assessment scale which includes like having hope for the future uh a lack of domination by symptoms uh willingness to ask for help um you know things like that however post-traumatic growth is not really is not at all correlated with uh, with clinical forms of recovery so it has nothing to do with you know whether somebody is remitted from symptoms it has nothing to do with if someone has a job or, or not it's so it's it's that PTG doesn't seem to be like a clinical an indicator or have anything to do with clinical clinical outcomes, um, and I think this is this is actually a good thing because it also it, it could show that you know whether someone is uh, experiencing symptoms or 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 you know not 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 at the state where they're you know fully recovered or whatever uh, symptom wise that they could still find ways that they're they're growing and you know, appreciating life more and, and so forth. And I, I think that's, that's kind of a, a message that could provide um, hope for, for a lot of people. Um, so now we're, we're just gonna move on to, I guess the final part of where we're gonna talk and we're gonna just go over some of the, the research that we've done and uh, you know, how, how this all connects to the topic. So, I mean, in general, my, my broader research is focused on, you know, asking people uh, interview questions about how they've they've grown after their psychosis, and also um, giving people questionnaires uh, assessing their their growth. So during my dissertation, I gave um, uh, you know a measure of post traumatic growth to ninety four people who experienced the first episode of psychosis. Um, they were all you know receiving care at a, a specialized early intervention service in, in Canada, and um, uh, and then I also interviewed twelve people to ask them about their own subjective experiences of what. Uh, positive change was like and what what helped them experience positive change and so when I gave people questionnaires uh, I found that most people reported experiencing post-traumatic growth and the, the curve of responses was actually quite normal so that means that there were a lot of people that reported growth and there were people that didn't report growth but it was kind of like um, you know the way that an IQ curve looks so it's it's you know that that was to me very surprising and when I looked at all the domains of post-traumatic growth, uh, the one that people endorsed the most was having a greater appreciation for life. Um, and the, the domain that people endorsed the least was uh, spiritual change. So I guess people didn't grow spiritually as much as they appreciated life more as a result of their uh, experience of psychosis. And then when I asked people about uh, the changes that they experienced, um, the people talked about how they experienced both declines and difficulties following the psychosis. Um, however, they also talked about experiencing I'm sorry, um, improved health, uh, a stronger sense of self and improved personality, stronger, more balanced spirituality and religiosity, um, more improved relationships with others, improved lifestyles, goals and expectations for the future. And for a lot of people, these changes uh, re kind of represented fundamental shifts in, in how they were before. So these were like new ways that they, they, they were, you know, they weren't like this before the psychosis or ever. But then for other people, these changes kind of seem to um, relate to attempts for them to reconnect with how they were before the psychosis um, ever happened. So like how they were as kids, like trying to reconnect with how they, you know, how, how they felt playful and more creative as, as kids. But then also attempts to kind of solve uh, problems that people saw as perhaps precipitating the psychosis for the first time. So some people talked about how, you know, they, they wanted to get rid of uh, relationship, they want to end relationships with people that, who they thought were toxic and led to the psychosis. Or some people, especially uh, females that I interviewed, uh, talked about how they wanted to end, you know, relationships with abusive partners uh, and so forth, or even like leave, you know, somewhere in cults, they left cults. 
Um, and then, like I spoke to a little about a little bit a bit a little bit about earlier, um, some people also talked about how they wanted to like you know take their experience and give back to the, to, to their communities and 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 people that um, that were in their surroundings, like loved ones. And people talked about wanting to give back, especially if they seem to be uh, in contact with others with lived experience. So if they were receiving peer support, and so you know, I also ended up looking at how you know, peer support kind of shapes or facilitates how people uh, give back to their communities and so forth. And, you know, I, I found that, you know, it, it does, um, but um, what's important is for that peer support not to be offered within a hospital-based service. Um, when I interviewed people about, uh, you know, why that is, they often said that it's because uh, in hospital-based services, uh, peer support workers are often uh, doing the, the work of clinicians and they're not doing what makes uh, peers very pow powerful in the sense of facilitating, um, you know, growth type type outcomes. Um, so yeah, that's my work in a nutshell. Um, I think Fiona's, yeah, Robin, would you like to discuss um, your research findings? I sure would. Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> so I um, did my master's dissertation research with participants from the UK, Canada, um, Denmark, Finland, and the Netherlands um, using in-depth narrative interviews. And one of the, the first things that came up really clearly was people spoke about their, their frustrations um, with not being allowed to talk about their experiences in psychosis and not being able to make sense of, of their experiences on their own terms. So often they say might be hospitalized and then they would be um, forced to accept the biomedical model. So basically being told that their experiences have absolutely no meaning whatsoever, and they're just symptoms of illness. And of course, that was also under the threat of, of coercive care. So being forced to take medications and being sectioned against people's will. And so that was perceived as um, quite damaging to people's well-being. And so people talked about a, a big part of how they were able to, to find growth and positive change had to do with finding communities, whether that was online or in person, that, that allowed them to be where they were at in their journey, um, that helps them interpret their experiences on their own terms and provided frameworks outside of the biomedical model that might be more culturally relevant, for example. Um, and, and being in an environment that felt safe and like they had um, human rights. <laughs> um, so psychosis was uh, sometimes thought of as, as a type of pur purposeful process um, that again, John Weir Perry and R.D. Lang talked about uh, that allowed them to gain greater self-understanding and insight and work through traumatic things that had happened in their life. Um, of course, there were very um, negative experiences as well, um, but one of the, the big things that came up for people was um, an increase in compassion and capacity to love. So some people talked about that in terms of going through this, this really confusing and, and challenging time made people gain uh, empathy and, and helps them want to help others navigate through their own crisis. Um, and, and sometimes they felt that the experience of psychosis itself kind of expanded their consciousness and, and the process of what they went through increased their, their capacity to love and to have stronger relationships with themselves and, and others. Um, so one, one participant says, I'll just read it out, um, it changes from selective love from exclusive love to an inclusive love towards everyone, this universal love for everyone and everything. Someone else talked about um, this intense love that you have, that your system has for yourself. And when you experience that, that's so huge. Um, so that was, that was part of their, <clears throat> what they experienced in that, the psychosis. Another big one that came up was people talked about um, gaining a greater alignment with their authentic sense of self and their kind of life purpose. Um, so one person talked about how, how 
this experience of psychosis has taken her on a path which has led her to find the things that are really me and find the things I really want to do. And again, a lot of people talked about going into healing professions or entering peer support, wanting to help others um, through li their lived experience, becoming more of themselves, not less. Um, others talked about how their altered states really gave them a lot of creativity and informed their, their art and their um, career and their drive that way. Um, and then, yeah, so, and, and the sort of caveat with that is that um, people also talked about that they needed wraparound support to achieve this, um, such as financial support so that they had a, some sort of social safety net so that they could achieve those goals on their own terms. And then the last thing that was raised, which I found really interesting, was talking about psychosis as a potential benefit to the community. Now, of course, we don't often hear that, right? We, we research is focused on the, the risk and harm that psychosis poses to society. We talk about global burdens of disease and disability adjusted life years. And so we don't really give attention to how these alter states and different ways of knowing and sensing and experiencing the world can actually be a benefit to society. And I'll, I'll read out another quote from a participant who says, painful stuff is never individual. It may be part of an individual journey, but it's likely to also be part of greater issues that the, the individual could never tackle on their own. And we all miss out when we don't see, when we don't face that issue or that complexity or that pain. So the idea that um, a person's individual psychosis can provide insight into the wider culture and its values, its inequalities, its shortcomings. Um, and again, people having, uh, feeling like they have a deeper compassion and a, and a greater sense of purpose and desire to help others um, is certainly a benefit. And when we incorporate these, these diverse ways of, of being in the world, um, that, that can ripple out into the wider community, as, especially when we don't just kind of dismiss them or write them off as abnormal and deviant behavior. That's so cool. Um, for anybody who doesn't know Robin, she, she, the, the, the work that she just uh, spoke about now is in her master's thesis. And I, I had the privilege of, of reading it. And Robin, I, I, I emailed this, I, I sent you an email about this, but it was, it was so well written. And I thought it was so cool to see that like our, our research findings were kind of similar in a, in a lot of ways. Like, um, and I, you know, one of the limitations of the work that I felt I did was like, it was within a service. So I always wondered like if, if people were, were talking about things and like from, the, from their perspective of trying to please services uh, and, and their clinicians and stuff. And, and to hear that, you know, you, you, you found the same types of stuff, um, not with, outside the limitations of like how I recruit participants is like really super cool. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good, uh, really good research. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, your stuff in print uh, one day soon. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, click this thing. Uh, all right. So uh, Fiona, uh, would you like to share some of the work that uh, that you've that you've been doing? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I I also wanted to echo Jared's um, words about your research, Robin. Um, yeah, I'd love to see your um, research in print because I think it would be so beneficial to so many people. So. <laughs> Um, so my research um, is a little bit different. I wasn't, I guess I haven't had the opportunity to kind of go out and talk to people about their experiences of PTG just as yet. So my research is kind of um, used synthesis. So I did a systematic review looking at um, what PTG and psychosis. So my colleagues and I, Jared included, um, conducted a seven language systematic review to identify what the predictors and also what the facilitators of PTG across the psychosis continuum are, continuum are. So we were interested in people who used mental health services and also those who services either, um, just so that we can have a broad 
um, spectrum of perspectives, as we were just saying before, because are they different? Are they not different from what it sounds like? They're not that different. Um, so we tried to make it as broad as possible. So we included all the papers that um, that use different methodologies. So we included papers that were qualitative, quantitative, and also mixed methods. Um, so overall, we found that there were 37 papers that met our inclusion criteria. Although we did search in seven languages, unfortunately, all the papers that came back were in English, despite our best efforts. Um, so that does say something about um, the, I guess, the cultural applicability of the finding as well. So it might be more applicable to Western societies compared to what Western or um, individualized individuals rather than collectivist societies as well. Um, and also the papers were predominantly qualitative as well. So another caveat of maybe more applicable to Western societies. Um, but we did find that there were some papers that were quantitative for um, mixed methods. So I think there was about six or seven. Um, in terms of understanding the correlates um, and the mediators of PTG, we found that there were 11 factors that were positively um, associated with PTG and this included things like having meaning in life, um, being able to positively reframe a situation, having the urge to talk about um, their experiences and also actually disclosing to others about one's experiences as well. There was other factors to do with um, self-efficacy, resilience, um, the person's perceived level of social support, which um, Robin talked a lot about before, um, a person's core beliefs and also a person's sense of personal recovery as well. The only factor that came up that was negatively associated was a clinical um, measure called the PANS or the positive and negative stress scores, which feeds into what Jared was saying that it's not quite related to um, in terms of mediators, we only found that there was one significant mediator, which was meaning in life. Um, and this mediated the relationship between psychosis and PTG. And I think this is really important as it means that we need to really focus on supporting people to make sense of their experiences and also to help them to find purpose in their own lives as well. So looking at some of the facilitators, we found that there were seven. Um, so this included things like um, personal identity of strength. So this includes like developing a sense of self-efficacy and also the reconstruction of one's sense of identity. Um, receiving support. Um, so this included both formal support, such as like therapeutic approaches, but also more support as well from like friends and family. Um, opportunities and possibilities, so being able to identify when something is a new opportunity, but also having the willingness to have a go. Um, strategies for coping, so not only um, developing new coping strategies, but also developing new skills that are of value to oneself and also disclosure or talking to other people about one's experiences. Perspective shifts, so reframing of experiences. The emotional experience also came up, um, which was interesting. Um, and this um, not only kind of, this wasn't only just about kind of improving one's kind of like symptoms like that. It was also about um, seeking new information, um, but also having empathy and compassion for oneself and also for others as well. And finally, the last one was about um, having relationship, uh, improving one's relationships with others as well. Um, and when we um, organize these facilitators, we, it, well, we organize the facilitators in such a way to give the acronym PROSPER. So um, future research will be um, using this PROSPER framework to um, develop an intervention that specifically targets um, PTG and people experience of psychosis. So that's a nutshell of what I've been doing with my research. And that's that's a very that's a very cool nutshell. Um, yeah, I, and I'm so I'm so grateful. If, um, to you for 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 being involved in, in this paper I, I think it's a, a real game changer and i'd really i think it's gonna like um like help establish the the, the field like this field uh more and kind of like set the stage for for you know the research to come um yeah. in, in the future yeah and i'm really looking at so it's it's you know it's, hopefully it's going to be uh, published soon in bmc psychiatry 
Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is our, our final slide uh, before we break the questions. So, um, so what, what do you think uh, we need to do or what, what should we focus on uh, last um, or in the future uh, when we're you know, doing this type of work? Um, Fiona, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think we know that not everyone who experiences psychosis also grows. So kind of maybe having some understanding of how many people actually experience psychosis helpful but also take quite a long time I think from research from academic psychology so um, looking at um, like general populations and measuring PTG they suggest that PTG can take like it can take like up to three or four years for someone to experience PTG but we don't really know how long it takes in psychosis so maybe getting some understanding of that might be important so maybe do some longitudinal studies um, I think at the moment, there's also no specific kind of like psychological intervention that targets genes like this either. So perhaps co-producing these interventions might also be important people but it may also contribute to new um, treatment innovation in the case as well. Yeah, cool. Those, uh, those, those are all uh, serious gaps in, in the work and the, the research and, uh, and, and in practice that you've identified. Um, and yeah, hopefully that's that's those are some things that you're going to be able to to pursue um, as, as you move forward in your career. Yes. Um, Ro uh, yeah. Robin, um, what about you? Yeah, definitely understanding the factors involved in in why some people experience um, post traumatic growth and positive change and, and why others don't. Um, I'm really quite interested in um, meaning making and how these these frameworks for for understanding psychosis impact recovery outcomes. So, for example, if someone's told that um, their condition is sort of chronic and debilitating, how does that then um, influence their identity and and kind of under their their sense of hopefulness about the future versus um, other frameworks that might be um, more, more fluid and might, um, allow the person to, um, interpret things, uh, interpret their experiences in a more co collaborative way. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's definitely one. And then also understanding how a person's support network and social network sort of influences, um, post-traumatic growth because, you know, as, as a lot of people with um, family members going through psychosis know, it is something that that really affects the whole family and the whole social circle. So, so um, yeah, that that relationship with with other people in the social network is something I'm interested in too. Cool. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. And uh, you know, if you go on to do a PhD, those sound like cool ideas to like pursue and and to look to look into it in more depth. Um, for from my perspective, I'm I'm more interested in uh, looking at how like broader things kind of influence post traumatic growth, like uh, so like kind of you know economic factors, uh, political factors, cultural factors, social factors. Like how does how does all that kind of stuff kind of uh, shape uh, post traumatic growth? I think we have like kind of a sense uh, about how post traumatic growth in general is shaped by you know some things that are more proximal to people. Uh, but we don't really have like a good understanding of like how these broader things kind of make post-traumatic growth or positive change um, more more easy or difficult to, to experience for some people. Um, so with that, I think we're we're done our our the conversation part of our presentation. Uh, so I'll stop sharing, and um, I guess I could I, I could moderate the questions. Um, I'm just looking through the chat, and I'll. Start by uh, somewhere. <laughs> Actually, I, I moved the uh, the Zoom box thing in a corner, so I couldn't see what anybody looked like during the presentation. So I I hope I didn't uh, look strange, too strange. Um, Hi, Gerard, I can help you. So we have a question for the three of you. It's how close is self-efficacy to an internal lox control? 
And the second question is, um, please talk more about shame is relational, what that means. So I guess the, the first question about internal locus of control and self-efficacy is that, do you think that might be in relation to uh, post-traumatic growth? Yeah, the question is from Douglas. Did you want to maybe elaborate on that question a bit? Um, I, there is, a, oh, go ahead. I might take a really naive stab at the self-efficacy versus locus of control question. Um, I think self-efficacy is to do with someone's belief system. So it's about whether or not they believe that they can, for example, situation. Whereas internal locus of control, I think it's also to do with the belief system, but it's about, I think it's like how much influence that they can exert over the situation. So I think this, I think they're related, but there are subtle differences. That is my naive that I apologize if it's not correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I could have, I, I have anything to add to that. I'm not really, I, I don't know, know much about that kind of stuff. I think we can understand. Oh. Is, is there a possibility of unmuting uh, Douglas so that it could uh, elaborate a little bit? They are able to unmute now. So I guess, um, Douglas, you're able to unmute yourself. That really was helpful, Fiona. It was uh, in relation to your uh, comment in your, in your talk, yes. And, and so, I mean, how you relate to, to somebody with their experience, I, I'm not sure how to explain any further, but yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, was, was there a second question, Graziella? Yes, that is a question that is um, just to talk a little bit more about uh, shamey, it's relational. So what that means Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to something like psychosis, that's still so stigmatized in our culture, um, people can internalize that and um, shame can definitely be an obstacle in, um, in experiencing, you know, positive change and, and growth in psychosis. And in terms of it being relational, I think it absolutely is dependent on um, people people around that person, their, their family, their friends, their social so circle colleagues. I mean, if they're, if they're really, um, you know, afraid of what that person is going through, if, if they feel it's um, embarrassing or uncomfortable. I mean, psychosis is something that isn't really talked a lot about in our society. We often, we often hear about, you know, anxiety and depression. And so I think there's a lot of myths and a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and as well in our, in our mental health services, um, psychosis is often really quite um, stigmatized and, and people are treated with a lot more um, coercion and force. And so I think that can definitely um, increase a, a person's sense of shame when, when that's what's being reflected to them. So hopefully part of this work that we're doing is um, just eradicating some of those myths and, and showing that psychosis, you know, there is a lot of hope for um, um, growth and positive change and um, kind of challenging some of our assumptions about, about madness and normalcy. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. I have two more questions. Fiona, that is one question that's for you. Um, if you can uh, yeah, answer, sure. please. Yeah, um, in terms of interventions, yes. Um, 
in our next webinar, we will be talking about specific interventions that we will that can be used. And I'll be talking a lot more about the intervention that I will be developing at some stage. Um, so, um, so in a nutshell, it kind of combines cognitive behavioral and narrative um, therapy techniques to um, help people grow from trauma. It integrates peer support and it, yes, it is delivered online. <laughs> Thank you very much. And there is another question. Uh, uh, any thoughts on how to make space for great recognition of PTG while still allowing for the acknowledgement uh, for some the experience of psychosis maybe feel like it is characterized more by loss than growth? Some thoughts about this question? Yeah, I think it's, of course, really important to, again, acknowledge that not everyone has this um, <laughs> sort of beneficial experience in psychosis. So a lot of people do feel a significant sense of loss, loss of identity, loss of sense of self, loss of maybe job or, um, or, or uh, friendships. And so this, and, and like I think Gerald and Fiona have mentioned, people don't necessarily um, experience post-traumatic growth right after an episode of psychosis. It might be something that they experience uh, five or 10 years later when they've had some time to, to process that experience. Um, and I think with alternative models like open dialogue, for example, there's a forum where people can share those, those experiences of, of loss and grief and anger and confusion and despair about what they're going through. And I think that sometimes in our um, current mental health system, there, there isn't really space to talk about any of these things. A person's just reduced to a biological illness. And so there's not, not really a space for them to talk about, um, talk about what they're going through, talk about um, their interpretations of the content of psychosis, but also of course, those, those really um, big emotions. I, I would I, I agree and I, I would just like to add that it's it's not like everyone is going to be fully completely transformed you know into better people through their like it might just be they appreciate life more but then you know they're still struggling with everything else you know so it's it's not like you're either growing or you're not growing or you've grown or you haven't grown it's just like it could be a part of how people are changing after they've, they've gone through some something difficult but then there's you know so this there's there's space for that that sliver sometimes or maybe space for something a bit more broader in terms of how people are going to change but it's always you know usually well, it's usually accompanied by a space where people are still are still struggling and that's in my perspective uh where we we should be supporting people the most where they're struggling yeah there's also a comment by rory here that says loss and growth also aren't mutually exclusive which i think is a great point well we have a couple of questions here um have one question jared i think that's is it's for you because it's about uh with the intense pressure on safest users to recover almost in first way do you have any words about how the concept of post-traumatic growth may be used? Yeah, I worry about that constantly. I mean, not 24 hours a day, but it's something that I worry a lot about. And that's, you know, um, I, I don't think we have like a, a set of ethics or any, any way of doing this. Any, you know, we need to develop like uh, ideas about how to, if we're gonna intervene and help people grow or whatever in a way that that doesn't do that and i'm not sure if like i'm I, I haven't figured it out i've been trying to figure this out for like years and years and so i'm i'm very worried about it and uh like i'm not someone who's grown from anything uh, that i've gone through um and i've gone through all kinds of stuff myself um so yeah i i do worry about it um and i i'm, I'm sorry i don't have like an answer for how to how to solve that yet Uh, any thoughts, Robin or Fiona? Yeah, I agree with Jared. It's um, it's it's the same with like the recovery model and the co-option, and 
you know, um, I've heard stories about um, services kind of like um, services saying to service users, oh, you've hit your recovery target, so we don't want to do anymore. And that's definitely not what we want, um, particularly with PTG either. So, yeah, how do we stop neoliberalism? I'm not sure. I just wanted to add one more thing, like um, like the, the, the people who developed the, the PTG model have, have kind of done a lot of like um, work around how to integrate this kind of stuff into clinical practice. And they've always emphasized that, you know, the, what we should do is, you know, facilitate it. So if someone mentions that they're, they're growing, then you just kind of nudge them in a direction, but you don't force anyone to grow or you don't force people to be anything like you're there to support them. And then, you know, if, uh, if something comes up and they're like, well, I, I think I appreciate my life more, then you don't dismiss it. You don't tell them that they're being delusional because how could you appreciate life more? You know, you, you, you got a mental illness. Like you don't say that kind of stuff. You'd be like, okay, well, that's great. So let's explore that a little bit. Like, so, and that's how uh, Tedeschi and Calhoun kind of uh, talk about uh, how to do this. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting to look at PTG as a form of resistance um, because often people who are given these sorts of, of diagnosis are also um, given a really bleak sense of their futures. Um, and, and the idea of, of, I think, positive growth and, and change isn't always accepted um, in, in the biomedical model. So I was actually talking with an academic and clinician about it recently. He said, oh, no, that doesn't exist. That's not possible. Um, and so I think, again, psychiatrized people, people who've um, been through psychiatry are, are often dismissed and invalidated. And yet there are people who, who want to speak about their experiences of transformation and growth. And I think it's really important that we um, allow them to, to share those experiences and to create a space um, for them to talk about that without just dismissing it as some sort of delusional thinking, which it often is. Um, so, so again, it, it certainly is not about putting pressure on people to experience this, this growth, but it's, it's acknowledging that, that, it, um, that it does happen. And again, trying to figure out how can, can we as a, as a society, as service providers, as family members and, and loved ones and friends su support that process in people on their terms. Yes, oh, many, many thank you to the three of you, Gerald, Robin and Fiona. So the chat has a lot of questions, but I will ask you to come in two weeks when we will be offering the webinar, the second webinar, we'll continue this conversation. We'll be sure that we will answer all the questions. So I would like to thank you all. So how a wonderful conversation and thank you. And um, this webinar will be available in two days, please visit tomorrow. Please visit, visit your page at MHCC, share the information with your friends and came in uh, to come to participate in the next webinar on November 17 from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. So I would like to thank you again and, and have a great, great, great week and a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.